Good morning. It's so good to see you all here at worship at First Baptist Church of Middlesboro, whether you are a guest joining us uh, for the first time or joining by television or one of our members. Uh, we are so glad that you have chosen to join us here today. Uh, there is a tab that is on your worship folder. If you would, if you would fill that out uh, and, and, and drop it off, tear it, tear it out and drop it in the offering plate when it comes around a little bit later in the service, that will help us have a better record of your visit with us. Let me make a few announcements before we begin our worship time together. This afternoon at four o'clock, we will have our annual tailgate for missions. Uh, we've got plenty of food. Uh, the weather is going to be perfect. Uh, what a great afternoon to share uh, and fellowship with each other and talk about uh, some of the wonderful mission opportunities that we have participated in this last year uh, and some opportunities for this year ahead. I hope that you have already made plans to join us this afternoon out in the parking lot. Uh, if you have some, some friends, some neighbors that you uh, want to invite, Bring them on with you. Uh, make sure they wear their team colors and you as well bring uh, a comfortable uh, chair uh, and come ready to, to enjoy our time together. The Brotherhood will be gathering on Monday at 6.30 at Cordell Tolliver's uh, for a cookout. Uh, many of you all have already been made aware of that, but we look forward uh, to gathering together there. Um, this Thursday, we're taking a group to Angelo's at the point. We'll be leaving the church parking lot at 5 o'clock p.m., so if you have signed up for that, make sure that you're here on time. Um, this next Saturday, we'll be doing a, a Adopt a Highway on our stretch of, of highway uh, there around uh, the tech school. Um, we'll be meeting here at 9 o'clock in the morning, meeting in the church parking lot, and the more hands that we have, uh, the easier that job is. Uh, but we help uh, to beautify our community in that way. And then one other announcement, uh, toddlers through sixth graders, parents too are invited to come out to uh, Bill and Gloria's uh, farm next Sunday, October 23rd from 3 to 5 p.m. There's going to be a hayride, pumpkin painting, snacks, and, and just a good time will be had by all. Make sure and, and sign up for that and, and come and enjoy that time together. Let's stand and greet each other as we prepare to worship. There was a moment in my life where I was really having a difficult time. It was before uh, I finally began um, at seminary and was really struggling with answering a call to ministry. And in one of those afternoons that I just I was asking more questions and wondering more deeply, um, what am I doing in my life and where am I going and, and what, where can I find peace um, some words came to my mind. Uh, some words came to my heart as clear as anything. And they weren't words from scripture. They were words to a hymn. 
It is well with my soul. One of my favorite hymns of all time. That has happened over and over again through my life. So many of us have such deep connections to the hymns, to the songs of our faith and the way that they resonate with different parts of our journey along the way. You've noticed that we have been doing a hymn of the month and hearing the words from some of these hymns, old and new, in different ways. Sometimes it takes changing the tune or hearing the words spoken rather than sung. Sometimes we don't even need the words. We know them by heart. We are going to experience... Uh, our hymn of the month, Lord, Here Am I, in a different way this morning. And I hope that it will be meaningful for you. If you'll notice, there are some places throughout your worship folder uh, where there is a call and response. Um, and when you hear us give the line, Master, thou call us in this, I reply. It's your opportunity to finish the end of the line. God, you call, I gladly obey. Will you give me some direction? My heart is fed as I worship you. My love for you grows as I take part in our times of Bible study. Is there a place for me to serve and share all that I have learned? Master, thou callest. I gladly obey, only direct me and I'll find thy way. Master, thou callest, and this I reply. Ready and willing, O Lord, hear I. Our hymn of praise is number 319 in your hymnal, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let's sing together. and minds as we pray together. 
Holy God, we praise you, our King of creation. Loving parent, we praise you for sheltering us under your wings. Almighty God, we praise your goodness and mercy that daily attends to us. During our time of worship this morning, open us. Open us, O oh God. Open our eyes that we might see more clearly. Open our ears that we might hear your call to us. Open our hands that we might share with our community. Open our hearts that we might be changed from the inside out. Open our lives that we might participate in the redemption of the people and places and situations of our world. And as you continue your work among us, may the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray these things in the name of the one who journeys with us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, I need you to teach me the mission that you've chosen for me. I have a safe and a warm place to live. Is there a way to share of my abundance? Could my hands offer help in disaster relief in our town? Can my feet go to extreme build and work alongside others to give a family a new start? Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor and where it shall be? Master, thou callest, and this I reply. Ready and willing, Lord, here am I. At this time, all of our children are invited to the front for children's time. Good morning. This morning we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a special prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And Jesus also teaches it to us because we find it in the Bible. You know, it's a prayer that we say together every Sunday during our worship service. And it's called the Lord's Prayer because our Lord Jesus came up with it and taught it to us. And so for the next few weeks we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer and going, actually going line by line and trying to understand what Jesus is telling us to pray about. Um, so for the next few weeks, that's what we'll be doing. And this week, we're starting with the first line. You read what it says? It says, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Can you say that with me? Our Father who art in heaven. Now, art's kind of a weird word, isn't it? Okay, let's think about this for a second. This is actually an old word that we don't really use very much anymore. Um, and it basically just means is. So, God, so Jesus is telling us that God's in heaven. So we could say our Father who is in heaven. That's what that word art means. Um, so Jesus is telling us two things, that God is like a father and that God's in heaven. Have you ever tried to get uh, the attention of an adult who just wouldn't listen? Maybe you're tapping him on the shoulder. Listen to me, listen to me. Well, one thing we know about God is that God's never too busy to listen to us. God's never too far above us to hear our prayers, that God is ready and willing to listen to us. And one thing that Jesus tells us about God, that's why Jesus calls God Father, that God is like a loving parent who stoops down and looks in our eyes and is ready to listen to what we have to say. God is a good parent. God is a loving parent. And that's why Jesus calls God Father. Uh, so one of the things that we learn from this first line of the Lord's Prayer is who God is. Can you say it with me one more time? Our Father who art in heaven. Very good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus and for this prayer that he teaches us to pray. Amen.
Savior, I'm willing to take up the cross. As long as you're beside me, I can handle what comes. I will search for your leadership and I will call on your grace to support me. Can I share that same support with others who need the assurance of your presence? I can bring food to put in our Christmas baskets. I can bake cookies for those living in the boys' home. I can donate coats and clothing for cooperative Christian ministries. Willing my Savior to take up the cross, willing to suffer reproaches and loss, willing to follow if thou will but lead, only support me with grace in my need. Master, thou callest, and this I reply. Ready and willing, the Lord hear am I. Our hymn is number 482, Here I Am, Lord. Will you stand with me as we sing together?
Let us pray. Dear Lord, all that we have, you have given to us. Help us to use what you have given us wisely and also know that because it is yours, we can give it back to you so that others may also use it wisely. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. my God, and I have so little to offer. Forgive me when I turn away from you. Take pity on me and bring me back to your light. Sometimes we all feel isolated. Is there a place where I can reach out to those outside the walls of this church? Could, it, could I be one of those extending our worship community into Middlesbrough Health and Rehab? Can I offer fellowship and friendship to those who are disconnected because they aren't able to leave the place where they live? Living or dying, I still would be thine. Yet I am mortal while thou art divine. Pardon whenever I turn from the right. Pity and bring me again to the light. Master, thou callest, and this I reply. Ready, Ready and, and willing, willing, Lord, here am I. I want to be like Jesus, I want for every hour of every day, I want to be like Jesus, I want to be like Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. Every hour of every day, I want, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be 
I know you've experienced it over the years. This, those moments when worship can sort of feel like a drama that, that you suddenly are enveloped into. It's something that, that you get sort of swept up in and you get a sense of the larger picture of what it is that we are connected to. It's part of why we read those hymns today like we did, to remind ourselves, to remind each other a larger picture of what it is that we do as followers of Jesus, as church people, that every day, in so many different ways, we are offering these small yeses to God. And every day, every week, as we offer our yes to God in doing this, in saying that, in showing up at this moment, in being present, we are becoming like Jesus. It's a process of maturity, of growing into maturity, of becoming like Christ. It doesn't happen all in one moment. It is a life spent pursuing the kingdom of God and what God is growing in us. And sometimes worship, hopefully every time, causes us to remember, causes us to put back those pieces that, that over time, over a, a difficult week, over uh, things that we are struggling with in our life, that we forget and we come back together as the people of God And the spirit moves in us and we put those pieces back together and we emerge saying, aha, I remember who I am, whose I am, and what I am called to do in this world. This is a time for remembering like a family reunion, how many 
of you all have ever been to a family reunion. I, I learned some things from time to time at family reunions that I didn't know. Sometimes you meet people that you've only met once or twice ever. Tr Trish was telling me the other day about going to reunite with some family in search of she had a photograph and she wanted to figure out, is this who I think it is? Nobody, nobody knew. Sometimes we go searching out identity, our own, others, the identity of our family. I remember at a family reunion uh, around the 4th of July, after Andy and I were both out of college and both in graduate school, we both came to the realization that we we each are doing the things that our grandfathers did. It hadn't hit us up until that point that my, my brother is an accountant. My mother's father was an accountant. He was an auditor for Pan Am. And here I am, a minister following my paternal grandfather's path. It hit us at a family Reunion, and we suddenly realize there's a bigger story here that we are a part of. That's what we are reminding ourselves. That's why we've been going through the book of Acts to remind ourselves as a church there is a bigger story here than just our story. We're a part of a much larger narrative of the church, of the life of the church, of the, the outbranching growth and ministry of the church, the expression of God in this world. And we've been able to pick up some of those pictures from family reunions past and look at those and be reminded here is what the church has been about all of these years. And here's what we are doing. And look, we aren't too far removed. Uh, we're going to spend just a few more weeks going through the book of Acts and then we're going to move towards Advent. Can you believe that Advent is almost here? It's almost December. Uh, we're going to spend a few more weeks going through Acts. And, and today I want to just name a couple of snapshots um, from, from chapters uh, 14 of Acts through about chapter 16. Just a few different things. I'm not going to go through and read them all uh, in scripture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize those. But, but some more pictures of what's happening as these Christians began to spread the good news throughout the cities and regions. In chapter 14, we hear that shortly after Paul has, has healed the man at Lystra, that those who were against Paul and those early church leaders, those early bodies of Christians, they stone Paul. And thinking him dead, they drag him outside of the city and leave him there outside the city. And the disciples, we're told, they gather around Paul there outside the city. And, and Paul suddenly gets up. And what does he do? He doesn't go running for the hills. He goes right back into the city. I don't know how many of us would want to do that. And then the next day we're told Paul and Barnabas proclaim the good news there. And, and we're told in verse 22 of chapter 14 that, that their presence there and the words that they were saying strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in their faith. And their words of strength and courage were directly pointed and, and were a reminder to, to those early Christians that that they're going to experience much suffering as they enter into the kingdom of God. That being a part of the kingdom of God in this place and in this time, well, you can't separate that from the suffering that you can experience at the hands of those who are in power. It's a beautiful picture of how the followers of Jesus didn't abandon a place just because there were people who wanted them dead, just because there were enemies. It calls up Jesus' command for us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Not an easy thing to do. It reminds us of the parable of the seed. That sometimes when you scatter seed, it falls among the thorns. It falls among the rocks. It falls among the difficult places. But you're still supposed to throw the seed out. It's a reminder for us as followers of Jesus that there needs to be an element of, of tenacity to our faith. 
a stick to itness that 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 we can't get discouraged, we can't get to a point that we just want to drop it all. Or maybe if we do, to remember we need to stay with it. As we keep going into chapter 15, we hear about Paul and Barnabas. They're sent on their way by the church, and as they pass through a couple of different areas, Phoenicia and Samaria, they started uh, talking about the conversion of the Gentiles, and they bring great joy to all believers as they tell these stories about the conversions of the Gentiles. And, and they make their way back to Jerusalem after making this loop. And, and when they get back to Jerusalem, they're encountered by a group of believers who feel it's necessary for those Gentiles to do what? To become like the Jews, to be circumcised, to, to follow the law of Moses. It's that Jewish and Gentile question that, that weaves its way through the beginnings of the early church. And as they are debating there, Peter enters into the conversation and basically says, guys, we have to trust the Holy Spirit God is doing something in their hearts just like God is doing something in our hearts. Remember, we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. And Barnabas then begins to tell of the signs and wonders that they have experienced among the Gentiles, among these so different from these Jewish, these, these Christians who have Jewish heritage there in Jerusalem. And through the next several chapters, as we follow Paul and Silas from this place to that, from Derby to Lystra to Phrygia, Galatia, Philippi, uh, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, all these places that may or may not ring bells in our minds, we're told that, that they kept the churches connected with each other as they went from place to place. This was a little bit before the internet. You got word by going from this place to that. Let me tell you about what's happening in this other community. Let me tell you about the good things that are happening there. What an important task for us to participate in wherever we are. Let me tell you about the good things that are happening in our place. Tell me about those good things that are happening where you are. Let's encourage each other in that way. So they keep these congregations connected. They share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people and households are baptized and join in following Jesus. They, have, uh, they cast out demons along the way. When they were in Philippi, there's this wonderful narrative uh, about them being imprisoned there in Philippi, which is a, a Roman uh, a colony where... Uh, where the Praetorium, the, uh, the Roman Imperial Guard, was headquartered. Um, it's a dangerous place to be a Christian there with the Roman army so close by. So they were in prison there and then miraculously freed, but they didn't run out of the jail. The jailer comes and he, he goes to the door thinking that nobody's going to be there, and there they are sitting in the jail with the doors wide open. They could have gotten away, and he's so amazed at this this miraculous happening that he and his family decide they want to be saved. I'm told about all these little stories along the way. And as, as, as Paul and those uh, disciples, as they share the good news, they were joined in following Jesus by Roman citizens, by leading women and men, devout Greek men and women, Jews, and on and on and on. They keep moving, they keep sharing, they continue trusting, and everywhere they go, people are giving their lives to follow Jesus. One of the things that we hear really quickly as we read through these chapters in the book of Acts, that, that there's so many different kinds of people from so many different walks of life. They obviously don't have everything in common. They don't hold all their beliefs in common. And we can imagine that, that as these different people from all these different walks of life are beginning to say yes to following Jesus, that, that some diversity is beginning to build in how people believe and how, how, what should a follower of Jesus look like, sound like, act like. We know some of that tension is there between the Gentiles and the Jews 
it's going to be harder and harder to hold a uniform belief. But so far, the early church doesn't seem to let those differences overcome their sameness in Jesus Christ. There's something that strikes me about about looking at some of these snapshots from the movement of the early church. That Peter and Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and the disciples and apostles, that they all face challenges as they go out seeking to follow the call of God to spread the good news. Chapter after chapter, we're told about groups that wanted them to leave, about somebody getting stoned in the bad way, the really bad way, hit with rocks, right? Um, about them being put in jail, uh, about a mob getting stirred up against these early Christians. It's not good. There's all these pictures of the difficulties that these early Christians are facing. And for whatever reason, maybe they didn't like their message. Maybe their power was being challenged. Maybe they just didn't like change. Or maybe they believed in something else. For whatever that reason, there was... Continual conflict. These early followers of God didn't have it easy. Sometimes we can think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to go back to those days, uh, to you know, centuries ago, how much better life would have been then? It's not always the case. Rarely is it the case. There's a lot of conversation going on in church circles all over this world about how difficult it is right now to do church, to be church. We've had some of those conversations. You hear them in other churches here in Middlesboro that these are difficult times right now. And some of it is talking about numbers that are down. Some of it is talking about people who just don't show up like they used to for for Bible studies or for Sunday school or social activities that that something has changed from what it used to be. People used to just show up. And sometimes we talk about it in the context of the changing culture, that Wednesdays and Sundays aren't sacred anymore, that that's changed and that's a big part of the problem. It's because people are busier, because they're more mobile, because they have family spread out in more places. I I see a couple of heads nodding. Y'all have heard some of these conversations, right? And a lot of times these conversations usually end with, I just don't know what we're going to do about it. I just don't know what we're going to do about it. And when, when we say that, What we mean these days when we talk about how difficult it is to do church and what we're going to do about it, usually what we mean, intentionally or unintentionally, is that what's really difficult is it's it's become really difficult to maintain the model of institutional church that has ballooned from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and on. That that's what's really hard, is, is maintaining that same model of church. I've been reminded as we've been reading through the book of Acts, and sometimes I think we all need to be reminded that that as we sit here in our comfortable pews, in our heated and air-conditioned buildings, with our resources and freedom to move and talk and live and share, that following Jesus has always included a cost. It's always included a cost. A cost, and we shouldn't confuse the cost of following Jesus with the difficulty of maintaining a model for organizing and relating. The cost of following Jesus is a different thing entirely from the difficulty of maintaining a model of organization that may or may not work anymore. There might be some of those among us who would say, you know, If I think about it that way, I'd much rather try to figure out how to put together a budget during these lean times than to risk being stoned to death and thrown out of a city. Right? Well, if you put it that way, I'll take A. Right? Of course, there may be some some people here who would rather face an angry mob than serve on the nominating committee again. 
And those would be people who have served on the nominating committee before, right? Give me that option. I'll take my chances. Since the beginning of church, since the beginning of people gathering together in communities and trying to live in close proximity together and make decisions together and move together, there have been differing opinions and hostile communities and environments and conflicts between leadership and people who didn't want to hear what the church was selling. It's never been easy. But there have also been, since the very beginning, the lame who had faith and were finally able to jump up and walk. There have been those communities who received the good news and were transformed and their story was an encouragement to others. Since the beginning, there have been leaders who risked themselves within their communities and who trusted each other with their lives and that trust was met with love and acceptance. For all that we might be able to say, any of us, to complain about the church over the years, I believe there is that much more that we are able to say in celebration for what the church has been over the ages and for what the church will be in the years ahead. You know, as we worship together, as we as we participate in Bible studies together, as we serve together, one of the things that we are doing, whether we realize it or not, is we are working through our present and considering our future and sorting through our past, all of that together. And I hope that as we do all of those things, as we share life together, that we spend more time talking about the possibilities for ministry in our community, in our world, the possibilities that are all around us and in front of us. I hope we spend more time talking about those things than we do about how it used to be or how easy it was or you should have been here when. I hope we spend more time considering all of those possibilities that are there in front of us. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the only thing we can really do anything about is these moments that we have here in front of us. These needs that we have all around us in our community. These people that we have been given to connect with and support and love and care for and worship with. These resources that God has blessed us with. These challenges that our community and our church and our individual families face the strengths that we have gathered through years of work and, and, and insight and wisdom, the facilities, these gaps between the haves and haves nots, the, the networks and connections that we've developed. We have all of these things here right in front of us. That's what we have to work with. And I wonder in 20 years, if we're attentive to these moments, these strengths, these needs, these people, these challenges, if we, if we are attentive to putting all that together and trusting what God through the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, I wonder what we will say in 20 years when we turn around and we look back on these moments together in our community, in our church. I wonder what we will be able to say. That was easier then than it is now hardest it ever was it was a turning point what will we say the other day I was over at, at Barbara's house and, and, and helping do a couple things there and her nephew uh, was there at her house and had a chance to visit with him for a few moments and, and he's um, recently graduated from high school and is, is working on going to college and and after about 15 or 20 minutes of working together and, and just making small talk, he, he said, well, what do you do for a living? I thought, well, there we go. Let's see. Uh, I said, well, I'm a pastor. I pastor a church. He said, really? <laughs> he didn't say, oh, you look too young to be a pastor. <laughs> really? You're a pastor? Well, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, doing this? 
We're, we're, uh, we're putting plywood uh, uh, into our house on the floor. How does that connect with being a pastor? Um, it was an opportunity to talk with him about the way I understand vocation, about the reason why I love doing what I do. Because moments like that are, in my mind, on my job description. They're part of my calling to step into all these different moments of life. Doesn't just happen here in a sanctuary, worshiping together. Doesn't just happen in a Bible study. Doesn't doesn't just happen next to a, a hotel bed. Sometimes it happens in a garden. Sometimes it happens on a work site. Sometimes it happens in the grocery store line. Ministry happens everywhere we are. Because God is everywhere that we are. In all these different ways that we encounter people throughout our days and weeks, God is there. There is nothing off limits to God's work, to God's transforming power. You know, people, people regularly say to me, um, in that conversation that I was talking about before, um, they say to me, Matt, I bet you didn't know what you were getting yourself into when you started doing this, when you became a minister, or when, when you decided to come here. I bet, I wonder, did you know what you were getting into? Would you still have made the same decision if you knew then what you know now? It's a good question, isn't it? And oftentimes I say yes. There's sometimes when I say, I don't know. There's sometimes when I say, um, no. Hard day, you know? I think it's a question that every follower of Jesus needs to ask every day. Do you know what you have gotten yourself into? As a follower of the risen Christ, do you know what you have gotten yourself into? Do you understand what being a follower of Jesus, what embodying Christ in this world is really about? Do you need to be reminded? Do we need to be reminded every day? Yes, we do, don't we? Because we so easily forget. We so easily forget what we have gotten ourselves into. Into. And sometimes I wonder if we really understood that and we had it all to do over again, would we still say yes? I hope so. I hope so. Because this sacred task of being church together is too important to ever give up. It's too important to ever stop trying to be church together. It's too important to let it slide because of some petty conflict or some time of disinterest. It's worth fighting for and it's worth giving our very lives to. What we do as the people of God in this world makes a difference in this world because we are not alone. The Holy Spirit is with us. The presence of Christ is in us and through us. The wisdom of God through the ages undergirds what we do. It makes a difference in this world. The God through the wilderness, the water and the dry places, food enough so that it never runs out, the consuming fire, the nourishing rain, the one who sets the captives free, the one who opens prisons' doors, who makes dry bones live, who feeds thousands of people, who heals the sick, who causes the blind to see, who emptied the tomb. That same God is present to us each and every single day. Every single day. God is with us as we minister to and care for Each other, God, is with us as we listen to the needs of the hurting and respond. God is with us as we provide food to the hungry. God is with us as we work to give shelter to those who have none. God is with us as we mentor, encourage the younger generations. God is with us as we forgive 
and are forgiven. God is with us as we pray and as we worship and as we study and as we share. God is with us as we practice hospitality and are welcomed home. In all things, God is with us. And we are called to give our lives in service to that God who knows us to the very core of our being and loves us still and still says, yes, you are my people. May it be so as we serve and as we live together. Amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 646. Teach me your way. If there's any decisions that you would make as we stand and sing together, will you come? This afternoon at our tailgate for missions, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from some other people besides me about some of the things that we have been doing this past year and continue to do as we look towards the future. I hope that you will come not only to fellowship with each other, not only to, to eat some good food and play together, but, but also to hear and to be reminded of the task of doing and being church. This week, I'm going to be gone for a few days to Atlanta to the CBF National Coordinating Council meeting. And I'm going to be staying with my twin brother in Atlanta to save a little bit of money. And they told uh, my niece Claire yesterday that Uncle Matt Matt is coming to stay, to stay for a couple of days. And she said about my coming, oh, when Uncle Matt Matt is here, can he make me an angel? I replied back to her, sweetheart, you already are. And so are you. So are you. You are the angels of mercy that God has called to minister to this world. Yours are the hands that will welcome. Yours are the hearts that will love. You are God's vessels of grace and peace to this world that is broken and hurting. And as we walk out beyond these walls, we answer God's call with our lives. Master, thou callest, and this I reply.